Welcome to Beyond Perception, where it's all about breaking out of a limited perception on life and discovering truth. And uh, yeah, also waking up to our humanness, our true self, and also to our connectedness with all life, including animals. My name is Simon, and my guest today is Zach Sko. He's the founder of Marley's Matt, with a mission to making a positive and lasting impact on communities by rehabilitating souls and creating second chances using the power of the human bond, uh, human animal bond. And from what I know, since 2009, you, your team, you have rescued over 5,000 dogs and also initiated the positive change program where it's about creating hope and opportunity for incarcerated people and pets. So mm -hmm. both may find a path home. That's a yeah. quote from your page. So welcome, Zach. It's, it's really great to be here with you today. Thank you. Yeah, nice job. Great intro. I'm, I'm so <laughs> good morning to all Americans. Good evening to anyone in Europe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I want to just provide a brief context. And I have shared this with you before. My wife, Brenda, who is a huge dog lover, she participated in a training, training with Cesar Milan, who is a well-known dog uh, training authority a couple of years ago, and met there a few of your team. Mm -hmm. And since then, we have been following your, your work uh, closely. However, I didn't really get what it is about. Yeah, well, And I just said that my wife yeah, has been a dog carer, lover for really all her life and she saved stray dogs in Mexico she's from Mexico originally and so on but I didn't really get it what what this dog thing is about until and, and that's what I shared with you she convinced me last year uh, to have our first doggy and he is from a shelter and uh, yeah I can say this yeah this little guy his, his name is Coco um, yeah he not only uh, yeah, showed me like what's what unconditional love really is. Yeah, yeah. but but he yeah has been one of the precious most precious gifts ever. And just in this short amount of time, he really transformed my life. And that's also why I cannot say like yeah, I get what it is about. And so yeah. I appreciate even more what what you're doing because I I, I can now understand it more what what is is which I couldn't before. Yeah. So um, yeah. What, what, what I love to, to ask you, though, um, have you been always so passionate about dogs or how, how did you connect with um, dogs? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I have always been this passionate about animals. I've always been connected to animals. So I grew up uh, at the beach and always drawn to the water, always drawn to animals in the water. So, you know, always and then outside of the water always had dogs. So we, we started rescuing dogs. My first rescue dog I found on the way home from school, from grade school, it was raining and his name was Speck. We found him, he was probably a three to four year old little mutt mixed breed dog. And he was in this rain gutter, just he couldn't have looked more pathetic. And so uh, he became our first rescue dog. Um, I think I was eight, nine, something like that. And uh, yeah, it changed our life. It changed, um, it changed the whole atmosphere of our home. My dad, who is an engineer and a very hardworking, very uber focused individual, absolutely fell in love with that dog. And it kind of throttled back a lot of the um, energy in the home and, and put a lot, a lot of our energy was just moving forward. My dad's an entrepreneur. My brother and I are entrepreneurs. And it kind of really dialed us back more into a, an emotional state. You know, my dad's not a very emotional person being an engineer. And this dog unlocked him, like it completely opened him up. You know, my dad didn't have a father either. So my dad wasn't graced with that knowledge and love of a father. You know, he had to kind of come up with it on his own. So the bond that he developed with our dog, Speck, was incredible. Every night before we go to bed, he'd, he'd go underneath the pool table, which is where Speck would lay. And he he'd spoon with him, you know, he'd just cuddle with him. And that was his morning or his evening routine with our dog. Uh, my parents divorced when we were very young. So we did the same thing at my mom's house. We had rescue dogs. We had some dogs that my mom got from a breeder when we were younger, a um, couple of golden retrievers. But yeah, I mean, I've always been drawn to animals. I used to do this, this routine where I take my skateboard and my tennis racket and my dog and 
around my dad's neighborhood, which was an equine neighborhood. So a lot of parks and a lot of horses all over the place. So I would just take my dog off leash and my skateboard and we would just go all over the neighborhoods and feed, you know, there's a lot of fruit trees too. So just feed fruit to different people's horses. I would just trespass all over the place into different people's homes. And so it was just a little kid and, you know, it's non-threatening. It's just a little kid and his dog. <clears throat> and um, I'd go through, through my whole neighborhood and just interacting with different people's dogs and their horses and whatever else. And then when it comes to rescue, you know, my mom, my mom took back to the shelter two of our dogs during my lifetime and I remember when I came home I asked where's Bentley his name is Bentley and my mom had taken him back to the shelter and I remember being crushed by that and I remember not understanding it and I think part of my drive to rescue dogs in adulthood is to make up for some of those two dogs that we sent back to the pound when when I was a kid Um, but yeah, I mean, I've always been very interested in rescue and I got heavily involved in rescue before I got sick. So I, I became an alcoholic probably when I was 16 or 17 and was a heavy drug user um, really most, of, most all of my life. I mean, I was heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol for the last five years of, of my non-sobriety. So from 23 to 28, I was drinking 24 hours a day, using as often as I could. Um, but I also, you know, in my life, my perception of life was very, very negative. I, I was just kind of spiraling and I had been spiraling since I was a kid, you know, just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And my last kind of desperate attempt to plug myself into society and try to like save myself was to start working in rescue. So 2003, I started volunteering for local rescues through 2004 and that was really great, you know, that, but it was very self-serving. I, I was a desperate alcoholic and I was essentially volunteering just to say I was doing something positive. You know, I had my, my, my high school reunion coming up and when everyone asked, what do you do for a living? I couldn't say I was an alcoholic and an addict, you know, but if I could say that I, I saved dogs and that I spent my time in shelters and with rescues, then I had something redeeming to say about myself. So I was just very ashamed about my, where I was in life. And the only thing I didn't feel ashamed about was the work I was doing with animals. So that became a big focus. And then um, in 2008, you know, it was when I got sick and uh, everything, everything changed then, you know, um, we can get into that now if you want, or, or, uh, you know, yeah. I'll follow you. So, so the, I, of course, would love to um, hear about how you got into what you're doing right now from what I understand here. Yeah. It was so weird. It's such a strange yeah. path to end up as an animal, re- as a professional animal rescuer. Yeah. You know, I just never in a million years would have thought that's what I would be doing. I would have thought fighter pilot or, you know, advertising executive or, you know, something that related to what my parents did. You know, my dad, my dad's a pilot and my mom is a, was an advertising executive. So those are the things that I knew. I, I grew up in music, so I had something with that. And, but none of those things ever happened. I was a slave to drugs and alcohol. I mean, you know, you, you, you can't pursue your dreams or anything close to it when you're enslaved by chemicals. And um, yeah, so I, I never really got to live the life I was intended until I got sober. You know, um, there's no bigger waste of human potential than, than addiction and alcoholism, you know, and it was... It had completely consumed me. I mean, all of my thoughts from sun up to sundown were usually associated with alcohol and drugs and, and the pursuit of alcohol and drugs. It's really, it really is, there's no, no better term to describe it than, than enslavement. You really, you, you, can't, you can't pursue the things that you want to pursue. Even some of the basic things for your wellness, you know, they, they take a back burner to pursuing your, it just becomes your life. It becomes your, it, it becomes, it, became my only way to survive was alcohol specifically. I, I couldn't, I couldn't tolerate being awake and sober. You know, it was physically painful. It was emotionally painful. It was, you know, spiritually, I don't think I had a, a leg to stand on. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I was working at the, when I got sick, I was working at the improv, the comedy club. Um, and I left there because I was, 
really got bad in terms of drugs and alcohol. I mean, I was uh, specifically drugs. And when I came, I kind of tucked my tail between my legs and came home to be with my dad here in California. And that's when my body started to give in, you know, so I started to um, turn yellow, started to swell in my stomach. And, and you know, I'm, I'm a 5'11", 175 pound person. And I was just getting very skinny. I couldn't eat. Um, I was developing this gigantic belly that just kept swelling and getting bigger. And I could hear all this fluid. It's called ascites is what the condition is called. And it develops when fluid builds up in your abdominal cavity because your liver or your kidneys aren't working. And so I, um, I started to get really sick. I started to bleed from my mouth and from my bum. And um, I knew that something had happened related to alcohol, but I couldn't face the idea of having to eliminate alcohol from my life. So I, I would just sit out like, and I really looked terrible. I mean, I was bright. I was really ye yellow. And I was bruised everywhere and like on my face, my eyes were really just totally yellow, sunk in. And I finally went to the doctor because it was difficult to hide. And the doctor said, you know, um, it was a nurse that came out. She sat down with me and said, you're in liver failure and you need to go to a hospital immediately. And she was like teary. She was emotional. And um, I was like, what do you, you know, what do you mean? And she reiterated, she said, look, you're dying of liver failure. And if you don't deal with this right now, you know, you're not going to make it. So I, I left that appointment and told my dad, instead of telling him the truth, I told him nothing was wrong. I just told him um, they advised to stop drinking hard alcohol, stop using drugs, but to uh, drink wine with dinner and all that kind of stuff. Beer was okay. Just completely lied and um, tried to keep the charade going for a couple more months. And then I, I got really, really ill to the point where I couldn't hide it anymore. And um, I got admitted to the hospital. I didn't have health insurance either. So I got admitted to the hospital August 3rd, 2008. And they admitted me for long-term long -term care. And, and I'll never forget it. The first thing that happened was the doctor came in and, and sat down with my dad next to my bed. And he said, your son needs a liver transplant and he's not gonna get one. Um, I don't know what to tell you, but he's very ill. He's in liver failure. And um, he, the only thing that's going to save his life is a transplant. He's not, he can't qualify for one. So this is where we are, you know? And so they set to giving me blood transfusions, frozen plasma transfusions, trying to get biopsies, but I was so ill. Um, they couldn't perform biopsies on me. They couldn't open me up. They could only drain my stomach, this huge thing. So they cut a hole in my back stick a vacuum tube in there and suck out all of this, this bile and blood that was accumulating in my body. And when you're in liver failure, you know, everything fails, your gallbladder, your pancreas, your kidneys, like everything goes. And so my, my kidneys, I had some severe kidney problems and I was going through alcohol withdrawal. So I, the first week in the hospital, I remember virtually nothing. Um, and then after that, I got addicted to drugs the, for the rest of the time I was in the hospital. I, you know, I remember like a fleeting moment of realizing that I hadn't drank in a week and being proud of that. Like, holy cow, you know, I've never not had alcohol. I hadn't gone six hours without alcohol, much less six days. And then I, I remember feeling that somewhat of a sense of pride. And then I just remember needing drugs. You know, they were giving me morphine and then Dilaudid. And so that's all I asked for. And I got that every three hours and became a slave to that. And that made me even sicker and even sicker and even sicker. And I wasn't eating. And um, I, I, I was in a hospital that didn't do transplants. So I was just dying. And they wanted to send me home on hospice care and were doing everything they could to get me out of there. They just didn't, I, they wanted me home with my family where I could die with dignity. Um, and then one day in my room, you know, uh, there was some guys from Alcoholics Anonymous. I kind of woke up and there were these guys there talking about sobriety and talking about how he had gotten through liver failure in prison. <laughs> and here I was in a hospital on the outside. And, and that was the first real sign of hope for us is, you know, recovery folks came and were there for me and um, tried to tried to help in any way they could. And it really planted the seed of sobriety in my mind. And those guys really never left. They, the the main one, Kevin, he became my Eskimo, which, which means he was the person that introduced me to sobriety. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're still close. So um, that was a really remarkable 
a really remarkable time in my life because, um, you know, I was completely helpless and I was dying and there was nothing I could do to, to change it. And um, I didn't qualify for a liver transplant. You needed six months of sobriety. I needed to get six months and they'd given me less than 90 days to live. So I had less than 90 days to live and I needed six months. And um, so there was just, it was just a really tough spot and we had no hope. And when those guys came in and that dude who had, was in liver failure standing at my bed, that was a huge shot in the arm for our family. And it really gave my dad a lot of hope that we could find a solution. And so he just worked the phones and, and worked. He's an engineer. So his mind takes in a problem and he's going to spit out an answer. He's going to, he's going to crunch the numbers and all that, taking all the variables and he's going to, he, he's going to come up with a solution. And that's what happened. You know, I, I got long story short, I finally got admitted to the comprehensive transplant program at Cedar Sinai, which is the best hospital in America or close to it. And that was also the hospital I was born at. And um, so one day um, they, my dad said, all right, we got your appointment at Cedars. Start pulling the shit off your arms. And the doctors at the hospital are saying, you can't leave here. He's gravely ill. You can't leave this hospital. And he's saying, bullshit. We can't leave this hospital. I am taking him to Cedar Sinai to get him in that transplant program. And I don't, you know, so we had to sign me out against doctor's orders and they put all my shit in a bag and we hit the road and, um, and we went to Cedars. I got, I met with Dr. Tram Tran, the, the head of the transplant team, and they admitted me to the program. Um, so I became a comprehensive transplant patient that day. Uh, they sent me home from the hospital because they knew the hospital would kill me, that the drugs I'd become addicted to were, would take my life. So they sent me home and said, look, you're going to need to go through withdrawals and stay close to a hospital. And, um, you know, if you can survive six months, you'll get the transplant you need. And so that was a big deal. Um, but then as soon as I got home, I went through withdrawals and like the ceiling came crashing in. You know, I, I went through just the withdrawals almost killed me. You know, I was so ill. And I was seeing things that weren't there. I was hearing things that weren't there. I never had more of an emotionally volatile state where I just wanted to kill myself, like where you just want a way out. And, uh, you know, I'm used to coping with alcohol. So I didn't have alcohol to cope with. I didn't have drugs to cope with. I'm physically going through withdrawals. And it was just terrible. And my dogs were in bed with me. And just having them in bed where I could, I could anchor myself to their bodies and their energy was just incredibly helpful to me because I, I thought I was losing my mind. You know, I thought, I thought I was dying, you know, I was dying and, and just having their presence was, was very important to me. Um, yeah. So I got through withdrawal and, um, yeah, long story short, you know, um, I mean, it's a long story. We could, we, it, we would get stuck in the woods trying to go through all of it, but yeah, the first big step that happened was my dog, my rescue dogs helping me get through that. And, Really, it was a it was a issue of combating suicidal thoughts from that point on. I just didn't think I fit in the world. You know, I just thought I was terrible at living. I was affected a lot of people negatively. I really hurt my really hurt my family, um, and I just didn't think I was any good at life. I thought I I was just bad at this, and that the best thing for me to do would be to take my own life. And uh, one morning, I had. I had gone to the bathroom in bed, you know, I pooped myself and um, I didn't want to wake my dad up to have to come clean me up again. He had done it several times. And uh, I just remember walking through my bathroom, when my bathroom mirror and catching a glimpse of myself and I was naked and shitty and uh, just crying, man, just really being devastated. Like, recognizing who I'd become and what I was and just it's hard to explain how low of a feeling that is where you you don't recognize who you've become or where or you you know you have like a good person in here that is, I've always known I was a good person I always knew I had um, you know a, a deep drive to be a good person and to help people and to to um, create positivity in the world and I just become such a a negative entity and be I, I have such a pathetic existence that I just um I wanted out I just really wanted out you know and I, I looked down at my dogs while I'm like just crying and and really suffering I mean I was having such a bad moment where I didn't recognize myself who, who I was looking at and I just 
I didn't know where to go. And I looked down at my dogs and they were so content. They were all just looking at me like nothing was wrong. Like um, dad was going to be okay. And that, not only that dad was, was I okay, that I was, fine, that I was already okay. They were all looking up at me like it was just a normal day and everything was perfectly fine. And I was the shit and they loved me and I was incredible and beautiful and handsome and, and they can see my heart and they, so I'm looking at me and I'm seeing this pathetic, terrible, dead, you know, no future, awful human being. And they're looking up at me and seeing the complete opposite, you know, and I could just see it in their faces. Like you said, like you talked about with your dog and they just, they blanket you with this love that you can't, you know, you have to be dead not to, you know, acknowledge. It's just a blinding, you know, affection. And sometimes we can write off dogs as like, ah, oh, they're just programmed for that. That's what they're supposed to do is give us love. But my dogs in particular, I had such a bond with, you know, we go back, you know, we had such an incredible experience together that it was just really important, you know, their acknowledgement, their, their family. And so their acknowledgement of who, of who I was and the idea that I was still in, that I was still in here was really important, you know, and, and that was kind of the, the catalyst for the rest of my life was, uh, you know, the next day I made a commitment to sobriety and um, really focused on walking my dogs, writing about what I was experiencing, trying to put my fears on paper, trying to experience a power greater than myself. So I would watch the sunrise every morning. I made it a pattern to wake up, watch the sunrise, go walk my dogs, try to connect with something greater than me. Cause I was just in here, just in here, trapped in here, not even any of this, just here, just here, fear, 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 fear. And I mean, I was scared of everything, people, places, things, everything. And um, it really helped me get out of that. It really helped me discover a divinity, just being out in nature with my dogs, walking, breathing, practicing being alive sober you know and it was uh that became our routine and then pretty soon thereafter you know like uh, two months later I was getting so much better physically I started I, I got really bad and then I started to improve and I was going down to Cedars every week for up for checkups and they just kept saying we don't know what you're doing man but keep doing what you're doing because this is remarkable your your numbers are going down and I had end stage liver disease. It's called end, not for, you know, fourth stage or level four. It's end, E-N-D. Like you either die, it's the end. You either die or you get a transplant. Those are your options. And so it became really interesting. They, they let me know that I wasn't necessarily dying and that I might have some hope and that if I kept doing what I was doing, I might survive or I might become eligible for my transplant. And, uh, so we kept it up and I radically changed my diet, you know, radically for two years, you know, no salt, just chicken and vegetables, um, walking every day, exercising and, and walking. I could barely walk when I started, you know, walking became hiking, became jogging, became stair climber, became running. And all of a sudden, six months, I have my six months, I get six months of sobriety. I go down there for Cedars for my big review and they basically say like, huh, well, Again, we don't know how the fuck you did this, but you're not dying anymore. Um, and your liver numbers are actually low enough to, you're not even transplant eligible. You know, so I, I, I couldn't get a transplant if I wanted one, even though I qualified because I'd been sober for six months. My num I wasn't sick enough. My liver was improving and my pancreas was improving and my gallbladder was, all, all of those things were improving. And uh, yeah, that, that really was just, that was how Marley's month started was just adding dogs to my pack, walking with them every morning, integrating them in with my rescue dogs. And then I started to get creative. I started to sit in front of the computer and write up their stories. Right. So if it was like a German short haired pointer, right. If the dog was a German short haired pointer, I'd say he was from Frankfurt. Right. And he loved, uh, <laughs> he loved Hefeweizen and, and schnitzel, you know, and like write these ridiculous stories about these dogs to give them a personality, you know? Yeah. And um, I, this was before social media. So I would just do posters. I was volunteering for um, those other rescue organizations. And it was great. It just gave me all this purpose. I got to get creative with the pictures and making their adoption posters and started getting them adopted. So I started meeting a lot more people. I was bringing my dog out into the, to the world. He was my therapy dog. And, and I, would, I started speaking at schools, started speaking at institutions, sober livings, rehab facilities, prisons, jails. 
um, my old high school, you know, I would go to regularly and give um, assemblies. So it really became this big deal where I was really, you know, through dogs, I was really facing my fears. I was getting out into the public and I was talking and I was sharing my experience and I was sharing my fears. And, and it became totally transformative. A lot of people related to me. I didn't know that many people had dealt with liver issues and, and alcohol related liver failure and death. And so I got heavily involved in that community and helping other people and liver failure try to better themselves and, and, and nutritionally and physically um, you know, beat the predicament that they're in. Um, so yeah, it was just, it was very organic, very natural how Marley's Mutts developed. And so at, at, by the end of this, that next summer, 2009, I, I incorporated Marley's Mutts. It became a, a, an organization and ever the whole community was saying, yeah, you should become a dog rescuer. That's what you should do. I'm like, a, a what? Like a professional dog rescuer? She goes, yeah, you should start a dog rescue. I'm going, that's not what people do like i'm not i can never i'm just a drunk i'm a recovering drunk and liver failure you want me to start a non-profit organization like i they'll never let me do that i was convinced that the state of california and the federal government would never let a drunk like me start a non-profit organization like i just thought that wasn't allowed sure it's allowed you know and uh so yeah i'll never forget that when the government came back and and approved our non-profit status and and it's been a, never, a non-stop ever since. We just, um, we have a bunch of different programs, you know, involved revolving around the human animal bond. One's called Miracle Mutts, which is our therapy program. Those dogs are out in our community all the time, rendering therapy in, in all kinds of environments. There's really no environment. It's really like wherever dogs can help people's mental state. So like at schools for finals, we have our, we send our dogs to school. So that in between finals, kids can go pet on the dogs and just decompress. And we send them to cancer centers where people are receiving. Help. We send them to um, sober livings and homeless centers and really anywhere that these dogs can help light up people's lives. And then uh, we started Positive Change back in 2015, 2016. So that's a comprehensive inmate canine training program. That program is active in six prisons here in California and one girls juvenile facility. And uh, yeah, we've graduated something like 600 dogs and, or sorry, uh, 400 dogs and 600 inmates. It's been really incredible. I mean, it is, it is the thing I'm most passionate about. You know, I, I really found my calling when I found dog rescue. And then I, I really plugged into my purpose working with dogs. It really helped introduced me to the world. And then I found advocating for the incarcerated, you know, people very much like me who had substance abuse problems, alcohol problems, self, self-hatred problems. Um, and, uh, I just very much relate to their struggle. And I, I, you know, my community believed in me when they shouldn't have, and they gave me a second chance and I'm alive because of it. And I just feel like, you know, there's two and a half million incarcerated people in the United States. We're only 4% of the global population, but we incarcerate 25% of the world's human beings. You know, it's, a, it's astonishing how we warehouse human beings. And um, all, I really view those individuals as untapped potential. These are just human beings, most of them incarcerated at a very young age, and none of their potential is ever realized, and they're never really given a shot at, at one redemption and two at a, at a real life of, of love and acceptance. And I can't imagine as a person or a, to be identified as an inmate is to be identified as someone who, who never will be accepted. And I just think that's so unfair. I think that's so fucking unfair. You know, us addicts and alcoholics, like we're accepted now more than ever in our society, you know, before, when I first got sober, most people didn't talk about being sober, you know, because yeah. you got you would get judged to be an alcoholic or an addict. And that wasn't a good thing. It's the thing I'm most proud of to be, by the way, to, to acknowledge that I'm an alcoholic and a drug addict. It is the thing I am most proud of because um, it's the one variable in my life that could kill me. We're well, not the one, but it's the one that should have killed me and will kill me. And I, I love that, that I've been able to identify what was killing me to work out that process and in turn be introduced to an entire fellowship of people who prioritize sobriety. Like that's the other incredible thing about this journey outside from dogs is that I've gotten introduced to a whole group of people who 
are just like me. And I thought I was fucking unique. I thought I was very special in my addictions and my alcoholism. Like I was incurable. Like there was nobody as fucked up as me, you know? And this is an issue that a lot of people in early recovery have. And uh, it turns out I'm not unique. I'm just as fucked up as a whole lot of other people. And I found this incredible group that I now get to, to embed myself with uh, who are focused on the same things, you know, learning to cope in life without alcohol or drugs. So yeah, it's been a crazy journey, man. It really has. It's been incredible. And, and um, yeah, we're just trying to, to create as much positivity in this world as we can. And, I, and what I really value is helping take people outside of the, the trappings of their own mind and plug them into service. So one of the coolest things about rescue and, and animals is that you're being of service to something that can't serve itself. And in that service, you can plug into your own purpose, your your you're rewarding yourself for, for selfless acts. And for people like me who are very hateful of, of na very naturally hateful of myself, you know, to be able to acknowledge good things that I've done or that I'm doing, it's really important for me to be okay with me, you know? So it's really been a remarkable, a remarkable journey that is, um, that I feel very lucky to have been introduced to, you know, I, I should have died in 2008 and I didn't. And uh, I'm talking to you instead. <laughs> yeah th thank you for sharing your your life your story with us and yeah it seems that um, you got a second chance to life and uh that's what you're also providing to others now to um animals and incarcerated people who are less fortunate and you kind yeah. of the one believing in them or seeing them and um, yeah. enabling them to get another chance in life or, yeah, you just said the word believing in. Uh, now that I'm a dad, uh, and I understand, when you become a dad, you become aware of all the things your dad did that are not good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You become aware of all the patterns that your parents did that you don't want to yeah. recreate. You know, which is which is very interesting. And so, for me, as a dad of two little girls now, I have a three and a half year old and a one year old. Um, my focus is on believing in people. Is on is on instilling self-esteem, trying to instill self-esteem. So my question is, no, and, and you mentioned this uh, just by what you said, is like, especially with incarcerated people, there's so much prejudice, right? That they're yeah. labeled, they're like, they don't deserve another chance, possibly they, they are criminals or whatever. Would you say that everybody um, deserves another chance or that that in everybody is this innate humanness or that that sleeping potential who can absolutely man know, i mean that, that's a, yes i i definitely believe that the vast majority of people have innate goodness that they are inherently good you know obviously a lot of us deal with trauma which can lead us astray and we we deal with you know lack of ability to cope one of the things that's that's tough for people with dealing with the incarcerated is that they look a certain way you know they're in prison so they're heavily tattooed uh, frightening they, they, yeah. yeah frightening they work yeah. out constantly and so yeah. they're, they're imposing you know very intimidating imposing yeah. and just the, the frequency of a prison walking into a maximum security prison in in california is something that would blow you guys away you know first of all it's segregated so i'm sure prisons in germany are segregated or in switzerland if there are even our prisons in switzerland Prisons in Germany, they're probably segregated too. You probably have Turkish, you probably have Syrian, you probably have Germans, you probably have some level of segregation. But in California prisons, it's completely segregated. You know, Hispanics, Blacks, Whites, others, they are not, not intermingling. So it's just a heavy atmosphere. Everything about prison is heavy and it's, and it's very negative. Um, but there are a lot of people in prison. Well, let me back up. So the vast majority of our students, I, I know most of their circumstances, and they come from broken homes, they come from the juvenile detention system, they come from gang life, they're socioeconomically coming from very poor rungs of, of American society. Um, so there's a constant theme, a very consistent theme with most, with most of the violent offenders that are, are our students. And that theme is uh, very little parental involvement. Um, most of them come from households without dads, lots of drug use and alcohol use in the home, uh, abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, 
you know, all kinds of, of, and a lot of these guys were incarcerated as youth. So they've been in prison, the prison system their whole lives. And once you're in that system, it becomes outrageously difficult to get out. It's impossible to gain an employment. You can't be hired at most places if you're a felon. They, they won't allow you, which is incredible to me that, that you've paid your, imagine being incarcerated for 20 years. Imagine spending 20 years, your whole adult life in prison and then getting out and not being able to provide for your family or yourself and leaving you the only option of back going back to a life of crime, which therefore lands you back in prison. So 70% of American you know, prisoners end up back in prison, 70%. That's the recidivism rate, which is, is astonishing. Like that's just terrible. And it costs, it costs more to incarcerate one person in California for a year than it does, than I get paid. So it costs $83,000 a year to lock up one person in California. That's more than I make it's annually. A, it, a, and it just doesn't make, right? It's, 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 it's incredible. I just don't understand the the prison industrial complex is a very real thing. And, and there's a lot of things that feed into it. Um, but going back to, to your assessment that the incarcerated are very prejudiced, I can't imagine facing that, you know, this idea that everybody on the outside in America thinks less of you. And that's really what they believe. You know, guys who are most of our society thinks less of the incarcerated. And because of that, the incarcerated think less of themselves. They, they acknowledge themselves as being less than in many cases. So the last thing they need is less self-confidence. They're gonna get out of prison. They need self-confidence. They need to believe in themselves. They need to have some modicum of, of love for themselves. And, uh, and that's what we get to do. And that's my favorite thing to do. There's simply no human experience better that will make you feel more plugged into spirituality, to life, to human beings, to the, a spiritual sense of living than when you help someone believe in themselves, like help someone recognize that they have the ability to be good and that they are good, you know, um, and to watch that, to be another man, you know, acknowledging another man's humanity and that he has potential. It's very strange because I'm, I'm these guys age in many cases. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's one of the best things in the world to get to do that, to get to believe in somebody and in turn, help them believe in them themselves. And that's actually, that's exactly what your program is, 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 is attending, intending to achieve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you, yeah. I, I'm not sure that everybody who's listening to this is familiar with how that program works. Could you briefly explain? Sure. What, what is yeah. That? So we take dogs from high kill in, in the United States of America, we still euthanize millions of animals a year so in the united states we have so many stray dogs and so many dogs that are being purchased and then surrendered at shelters that we're euthanizing millions a year um, we take dogs from the shelter we bring them either to our rescue ranch or put them in a foster home and then a, just to get vaccinated to go through their medical checks to get spayed or neutered and then they go to prison and they live in prison that's a 14 week long program We do two weeks of getting used to the dogs, just getting used to have, most of these guys haven't seen a dog in a very long time, mm -hmm. you know? And in many cases, the last time they saw a dog was when they were apprehended as a police dog. So there's a lot, a lot happening. Um, so the dogs go into prison uh, for 12 full weeks, for three full months. They live there. They're training 14 hours a day. There are three handlers per dog. So a lot of guys are going to school in prison. They're working. They have different schedules. So that's why we have three inmates, three guys per one dog, and they team up. And it's always outside of the race. So we'll have, well, they have white to cooperate, guy, right? Yeah, black guy, yeah. white guy, Hispanic guys, and they got to work together. Yeah. And uh, and it's just a beautiful thing, you know. They really, it gives them a purpose. So so we're we're trying to help them understand that they're not inmates. They're not prisoners while they're in our program. They're dog rescuers and dog trainers, and just giving them that designation as something other than a prisoner you know you got to understand correctional officers don't shake their hands um they, they, they give no affection I mean, people aren't allowed to touch them hug them you know, a lot of that stuff is weakness in prison so they, there's no enrichment there's no emotional enrichment um that's one of the greatest things about our program is that it takes place in the prison most 
programs in prison are in a classroom. So they're in an administration building away from where all the inmates are. Our program is smack dab in the middle of the yard and in the middle of the pond. So that's where we're training. Where we're surrounded by people at all times. And, and therefore our program affects the, the energy of the whole facility. So drug dealing goes down, you know, it, it's just inherently more positive. There's less incidents. There's more cooperation with staff. There's more cooperation between one another. And so it, it really affects also, it's, there's usually a painting. So whatever, whatever area of the prison we work at, there's a huge mural with the dogs that says positive change. So just the whole effect of the program is extremely positive. That, um, influences, impacts people who are even not um, directly involved with the program. So there is a exactly. second effect from doing that. Yeah, exactly. It affects the energy of the whole prison because prison's a really dark place. I mean, you, you it like kicks you in the chest. When you walk in and you see a thousand guys on the yard or, or 800 guys on the yard working out all shirts off and all that, you know, you go, whoa, shit. You know, it's a, it's a, whew. And, and it's a heavy energy because it's, it's just a bunch of men who got to be tough, you know, and they're giving out, they're projecting that, that machismo, that, that aggression, that manliness. So everybody's projecting that. So it's just a heavy, it's a heavy vibe. So we go in there with high fives and hugs and, and, and it, it just really helps shift things and it helps provide a, we're really seeking to provide a healthy emotional space for guys to talk about what they're experiencing. Because the, the biggest thing about the program and why there's so much internal work is that the leash, we're asking these guys to rehabilitate these dogs. Rehabilitating a scared shelter dog means you have to understand what you're experiencing. If I say we had a really shitty interview and this went terribly and I got off this and I was so frustrated and then I went out and walked my dog. All of that frustration, all of that disappointment in myself, all of that anger, whatever, is being channeled through that leash into my dog. Mm -hmm. You know, the tension of just, it's an umbilical cord. So <laughs> what, we, what we teach in there is that if you're, you have to pause, breathe, check in with yourself, become aware with what you're experiencing. You know, am I tired? Am I lonely? Am I angry? Am I upset at my wife? Am I having a tough time with this or that? Really acknowledge where you're checking in at so that you can address it accordingly. And that if your energy isn't proper, pass it off to your teammate so that he can take the leash for that moment while you talk about what you're experiencing. So a lot of it, a lot of it's like, it has to do with that. And that's why it's so transformative. It gives them an opportunity to acknowledge their emotions. Most times in prison, guys don't acknowledge what they're feeling. Uh, it's, it's interpreted as weakness. And so I go in there very feely. I, I'm always feeling and I'm never shy about talking about what I'm feeling. So I'll go in there and I'll just talk about my life. I'll just be like, you know, this is happening and fucking this is happening. God damn it. And, and having a hard time. And, and what it gives them the opportunity to do is then be there for me. And so, so many of those guys have been there for me when I needed them. You know, we, we had someone try and cancel me. Um, we had a, a former employee basically edit a video and tried to cancel me, tried to, um, you know, sent it to every news station, this, this uh, edited video. And it was awful, man. We got death threats for like a full year. My wife's business got called regularly. The police came to my house. They came to the rescue. They came to our events. I mean, more death threats than I even, than I can count. I'm talking like dozens and dozens. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I, I was really, really scared. And um, I would bring it into prison and just kind of set it free there. And those guys were there for me in such a big way. And what was interesting is none of their responses had to do with violence. None of them were like, oh, someone's fucking with you? Well, don't worry, we'll take care of it. It was nothing, nothing like that. It wasn't what you would expect from, like what you would expect from the incarcerated. Instead, they really put their arms around me as brothers and said, hey man, we're here for you, I hear you. And maybe try thinking about it this way. Or have you been meditating on it? Or have you been processing what's the reality from, um, from what your mind is creating? You know, just really incredible advice because these guys have been locked up for many of them for 20, 30 years. And so they, they have to learn how to cope with what's happening because they, they're in prison. They're locked up. Their options are very limited. So it's just, we, we've, uh, one of the coolest things about the program is that it's a dog training program, right? 
but it's also a very deep, integrated, emotional, spiritual program that helps people believe in one another and helps people be there for one another and helps break prejudices and stigmas. And um, it's really just constantly evolving. And I think it's, it's always going to evolve. So I think we're just always going to try to make it better. And, and um, yeah, I just, I really firmly believe it's really impressive to get through a long prison sentence in a prison in California and, and get out. For you to make it through 20 years, it shows something about who you are. If you can get through that with your dignity intact, with your humanity intact, and, and be honorable, you know, you really have a lot to offer this world because, you know, people are forged through suffering. And there's, there aren't many people who suffer less than those who are locked up in California prison. It is suffering. It is absolute suffering. You would be shocked to just see how a lot of these individuals live, you know. Um, so to be able to, you know, I just fundamentally believe these guys have so much to offer because of what they've been through and out in the real in, in any number of, of careers. But what we've identified is that these guys are incredible dog trainers and that they can really take their skills out in the real world. So the majority of our students who uh, earn their freedom and are released from prison have become dog trainers and dog uh, rescue employees. And that's the most fulfilling thing for me is that we've, our program has legitimately changed the trajectory of many, many men's lives in a positive way and given them a way to generate an income and a living for their families, to grow their families, to get married, to have children, to, um, to be redeemed, because many of these guys are legitimately redeemed. Because, I mean, they, a lot of our guys have social media accounts and there's just so much love on these pages. These are guys that, you know, a lot of them served loss of life crimes. They were involved in, in a loss of life. And, and for that, you know, may never have been able to make it back into society. And to see them make it back into society and to see them giving back to so many organizations with the work that they're doing and to be providing hope and, and really the role models for so many of our students who are still incarcerated. It's incredible. And most of them are black and brown men. Our, the dog training world is not a black and brown men heavy environment. It is mostly white women. I'm not saying that to be negative. That's just a factual observation. The vast majority of people involved in the rescue and dog behavior space are white women. But it's a hundred billion dollar economy. The pet industry is a hundred billion dollars. That is absolutely enormous. The 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 entire music industry is thirty five billion. So it's three it? times. Yeah. No three way. Times really? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. The entire American music industry, touring, record sales, all of it is thirty five billion. <laughs> yeah. So just locking people up in America is, is three times. Uh, you know, so, but that just means there's a ton of opportunity in this space. And that because so many people have been adopting rescue dogs, the biggest need are trainers, behavioral mm -hmm. modification and training. That's the number one position that is needed within this economy. And that's what our program produces. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I, I, I've seen yeah, quite some of the interviews of um, participants in your program. And yeah, that. It touches the heart. It's like you see this big, tough guys, and then it's like it, it's it's um, almost as as they have been kissed alive. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. So pouring so much love and um, like being so um, so thankful for this opportunity, but also when they share about what they learned and how this program changed um, their way of like coping or seeing things. They, I remember mentioning. Um, yeah, how, how their self-awareness um, changed, totally. how they uh, were able to, um, um, to, to break through prejudices about other yeah. cultures or races, yeah. and also gain confidence about uh, like, that they actually have something to contribute. So, yeah. Um, yeah, because prison isn't a space where you can be emotional. If you, on a normal day in prison, go up to your buddy and say, hey, you know, I'm really... Uh, I'm really sad. Or if you go up to your buddy and say, hey, man, I really love you and give him a hug. That's just not something that happens in prison. But, you, know? but you also say that like, for, for, like, to, to, to digest something or to, to like therapeutic yeah. um, effect, you kind of need to also articulate what, what, like, what is there in terms of emotion. So, and, and that's something I can relate to because our doggy enabled me to do something similar. Yeah. 
in, in yeah. my own kind of um, experience in life. It's a, mm -hmm. It provided me an access to something like like a really safe environment without any judgment. It was this kind of yeah. seeing through my layers of what I thought I am or how I what I did wrong or how bad I am. It's kind of like for the, for him, it didn't exist. It was kind of seeing through like who I really am, my essence, and yeah. remember yeah. myself like to that thing. And that was, I mean, <laughs> moments of tears and joy. And it was just so a feeling of such relief to, to be yeah. seen. Yeah. Whatever. That's probably the most profound thing you've said. And, and I never thought about really how that relates to me, but that's exactly what happened to me is I discovered my essence because I started working with dogs. I didn't move through the world as a happy-go-lucky person. I just didn't. Um, but I started working with dogs and I saw the effect that dogs love have on people. Just take a happy-go-lucky dog, right? Take Koros, <laughs> take Koros, right? She's a happy-go-lucky dog and you take her and you bring her into any situation and she's gonna make someone just happier. She's gonna spread love and make you joyful. Um, but we also have the ability to do that, us human beings. So what my dogs taught me very much so is that I can have the same effect on people that a happy-go-lucky dog does. If I, I have every person I come in contact with, I can make their day better if I bring that energy. Yeah. You know, and, and it really taught me that my essence is that, that my essence is someone who, who desires to be connected to people through a mutual experience and to, to leave a positive streak where, wherever I go, that that's what I'm here to do is to basically be a happy-go-lucky dog who checks in with as many people as possible and tries to generate positivity in the world. And I don't know that I would have had the guts to kind of become that person unless my dogs guided me towards it, you know? That, that's something also what I witnessed now listening to you and also from your um, following your work is this authenticity or honesty about what's going on. And when I look at like what my dog is teaching me, yeah. it is, or like, or it, Or in other words, um, it's, it's a reflection of myself. So if I'm dishonest, if I'm pretending to be confident, <laughs> kind of like yeah. doing as, as if I would um, um, impose something on him or want him to do something, but I actually don't believe that he is, he's doing that, he won't do it. Yeah, he's yeah. Very stubborn. You have to be very um, aligned. Yeah? You have to believe what yeah. you're saying. So it's, it's kind of always he's mirroring your state. If he's... Yeah. Stress, yeah. not because he's stressed but it's because i am projecting yeah. my stress or uh, and, and so that's it, exactly it, what we talk about in there all the time it's just that really that's interesting uh therapeutic therapo therapeutic uh, coaching <laughs> yeah. feature having a dog it's it's kind of um if it makes you feel any better you just have to be authentic not to do yeah. admitting what's going on and to have this kind of spotlight on your own yeah. um We, we as human beings have to put masks on all the time. We have to wear these masks to like get through our day. You know, I, I'm feeling one way, but I got to put on a mask just to get through the day so that people don't know what I'm really feeling. Yeah. And like you said, your dogs require of you. You that cannot you know pretend anything. Like. Yeah. <laughs> They cannot. require of you that you be genuine in what you're experiencing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's one of the best things about the human animal bond is just that. Yeah. That's exactly. It's yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just so yeah, there's really the other thing. The yeah. other thing that I think is, is important is we, we oftentimes bring a lot of dogs through prison that are really struggling. And uh, we as human beings have a natural tendency to feel sorry for ourselves, okay. especially people with histories of alcohol and drug abuse, because that was how we got what we needed. Like, right, if you were my brother, yeah. you, I would have come to you over the years for things if, if, while i was in my disease i would have begged you for money dr alcohol drugs whatever all those things and the way i would have done that is made you feel sorry for me i would have come to you in this most groveling like low kind of to just try to get what i need and that's a default mechanism for a lot of people is if i can get you to feel sorry for me then you'll empathize with me then you'll 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 understand me and and dogs just don't do that they don't feel sorry for themselves they just don't have there there's a resilience and a uh, um a drive to move forward and we get stuck in you know like like cora rose right we, we had to amputate both of her legs I mean, she broke her back her legs her hip everything you know and and 
obviously she doesn't speak English, English, so you can't complain that way. But I've just never noticed any sort of, she's never backed up. She's always moved forward from it. That, that incident, that trauma was never something that she said, oh, okay, well, I can't really go on with my life, you know, as I need to, because clearly I don't have any front legs and I have this bad injury. So I'm just going to kind of not really do much of anything. That's not at all what happened with her. What happened with her is, oh shit, well, this happened. I'm going to allow it to, um, to, to better me, to make me an even better dog. And so her experience, like she became who she was after her injury. You know, I, I knew her while she still had her legs and she's a totally different dog. So this whole, she's become even more special. She's like this fucking, you know, a, a, she's like a, a unicorn and a rainbow and, and I don't know, and an alien. She's, she's all kinds of, of crazy positive things, but she is that because she never felt sorry for herself. She just kept moving forward. And, and that's a lot what dogs show me as well is to not, is to ignore the tendency to feel sorry for myself and just move forward, you know? Yeah, it's, um, wow. it was, what I've been talking with my wife about if you reverse a dog, it actually means wow. dog, right? And wow. so there's almost this spiritual component to having a dog. It, it teaches you, it brings you to the present moment. They are not in the past, they're not in the future. Yeah. They kind of, yeah, enjoying what is yeah, not, like it, it's always as if they were to investigate to 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 see what there is as if they were there the first time there's this curiosity this joy this um yeah. excitement and yeah it radiates very much so yeah. since we have a dog people are approaching us in a different way um so it's, it's kind of also yeah. changing everything around yeah and, um, yeah I think, I think um, we experience God's love through dogs. You know, we, we really do. It's, it's very hard for me to conceptualize God, like a Jesus or Vishnu or Buddha or, or Swami, whomever. You know, it's very hard for my brain to accept an omnipotent power of some sort that, um, or to accept love of, from, from something like that. But in recovery, you know, we are required to have a God of our understanding. We're, we're required to, to pray and to acknowledge a power greater than ourselves that you can call God. You can call it really whatever you want. Um, but one of the things that helped lead me to a spirituality and an understanding of a higher power was my work with dogs because I, I had not felt love in a very long time. I had love for myself, love for life, love from other people. There was just a, a real deficit of love in my life specifically for myself and I, it wasn't until you know i started working with dogs that, and, I, and i started to feel that unconditional love just getting just getting inundated with with unconditional love for my dogs i mean if you are having a shitty day if i'm having a shitty day and i check in with frankie and cora it changes how i'm doing it all alters my mood it all it, it allows love in and that's pretty powerful if you if you have a little if uh, dogs are tools that can provide you much needed love and perspective at any time and, and that's invaluable hmm. i mean i have been on that other side but there there are many people in our society who do who don't really care about animals and i have been there i i thought yeah. for really the most of my life that it's another thing yeah it's it's, it's a burden something to take care of may, maybe dirty or noisy whatever yeah. Um, I'm busy already. No, thank yeah. you. That's it's another task on my list. And um, yeah, having a dog, it, it's kind of it opened another dimension to life. Yeah? And, and yeah. Yeah, I, I told you I'm from Germany and I live in Switzerland. And we tend to approach life very mentally, a little bit disconnected sure. about planning, like our, our yeah. time, things, whatever. Sure. Um, it's different in Mexico, though. But so, so to me, there was a disconnection to this dimension of life, and um, a doggy, <laughs> or a doggy yeah. was, uh, yeah, he opened it, up this this experiential over. of of, of um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we have to say that dogs are medicine. Yeah, the dogs are medicine. They help cure any number of afflictions, dealing with like the head and heart disconnect, yeah. or dealing with self love. Or just a lot of different things. I mean, just in my own life, you know, when I got out of the hospital, I couldn't 
face the world. I couldn't go, I couldn't leave my house. I was just terrified. And my dog basically made me leave the house. You know, they made me get out. And um, when I didn't, couldn't feel love for myself, they made me feel love for myself. And when I couldn't connect to the present and I was only focusing on, uh, on potentially dying or and all the things I'd done in the past, they made me be present, you know, on, on my walks and made me plug into the here and now. So they've just along the way done so many things to help me where I couldn't help myself, you know? And one thing I wanted to ask you too, so you mentioned that usually um, incar incarcerated people are leaving finally prison, they go back to society, the percentage of those who return to prison is quite high. How is that different to those who finish your program? You have zero percent recidivism. Is it? No, nobody has gone back to prison. Oh, okay. Not one, not one that I know of, and I, we stay in touch with everybody. So. Um, as far as I know, nobody's gone back to prison. And that's like 50, 50 or 60 people. Okay, so obviously that indicates for quite some effect of your program. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm curious to hear, like how big or how, like with how many people are you working right now? And also what's your wish? Like, like, well, right now we are, you know, COVID slowed everything down. So two of our programs stayed open throughout COVID, North Kern State Prison and Bakersfield Juvenile Justice. The other program shut down. The other programs are opening back up now, um, which is great. Um, but the goal, so in the United States of America, we have animal where dogs are put to sleep. Just about every community has a prison where people are warehoused for crimes. Those inmates don't have a lot of hope for life on the outside. They're not being provided with much programming. Those dogs don't have a lot of hope, depending on what their situation is. We're spending a lot of money to warehouse dogs and to euthanize them. We're spending a lot of money to warehouse people and not really give them much hope. So why not combine the two ideas and help combat, you know, animal euthanasia, dog euthanasia, cat euthanasia, uh, and also provide a, a way up and out of this cycle of incarceration for a whole lot of people, a whole lot of families. Um, so the, the program, I'm not going to say could be, the program should be in every prison in the United States. And there's no reason why it couldn't. It would be very easy with the, so the infrastructural support, which is really just money, to establish this program in literally every facility throughout the United States. I mean, we have something like 30-something prisons just in California, and each one of those prisons holds thousands of people. So there's, you know, that's a tremendous amount of, of people that are that are locked up and incarcerated. And um, look, I mean, the, the pet industry really needs trainers. It is the number one uh, profession that is that 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 they're coming up short. They don't have enough. And so a lot of dogs are being taken back to the shelter because there aren't enough qualified. Like why so many people train with Caesar and at TCW, like your wife, is because there's so much opportunity within that work right now. It's 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 critically important. Um, normal be, uh, obedience trainers, th that doesn't do anything for what we're dealing with shelter dogs who have trauma and behaviors that are preventing them from being adopted. You know, they need to have dog reactivity. There's all kinds of issues. So trainers with a lot of experience are required for this. And, and our guys get a lot of that experience because they're training with shelter dogs the whole time they're incarcerated. So, um, yeah, this should be in every prison in the United States, period. And it, and it could be relatively easily. And from what you shared before, in terms of numbers, how much it costs to maintain or to facilitate one person per year in prison, it seems to be um, even a solution which might save a lot of money, right? Because Yes, that's a very wonderful German way to think about it. And that's exactly how we should be thinking about it, is that you know, for what it costs to incarcerate one person, yeah. why don't we put that money into these programs because their recidivism rate is zero compared to normal prison, which is 70%. So why not put funds into this, these programs? But convincing people of that is another story. We've done a great job, you yeah. know, so we, we, we have the support we need and we're only getting more and more and more support. So who knows, man, one of these days, I think really, really all it takes is, a group of, you know, one very powerful person or a group of 
influential people to say, they're onto something here. We need to expand on this. Let's give them the help they need. And, and we could be there because really all you need are trainers, uh, dogs, and our curriculum. Mm. And then voila, you have a prison program. I mean, you have to know how to present it. You have to know how to teach it. We have a lot of homework. We have a lot of, you know, the, the weeks are laid out. There's a lot of stuff going on, but we can do it in every facility. We just need the financial support. And a place like TCW, like Caesars and the Dog Psychology Center is another place that could produce a lot of the trainers that we need. Because really the, the only deficit that we have right now is, is trainers. We need qualified trainers who could teach the program. Okay, and, um, that both, yeah. Would have been a question I wanted to ask, like what resources are you looking for? What, what is needed to? Yeah, the biggest one is trainers, are, is money and trainers. So with, with the proper amount of, of financial support, we can do two things. One is create a train the trainers course at our ranch where we bring people like yourself or your wife to learn how to train the program in prison. We also bring some of our graduates so that those graduates can learn how to train the, the program. So the, the biggest hope is that we have our formerly incarcerated trainers go back inside to open up these prison programs. So we're actually employing formerly incarcerated dog trainers to go open programs up all over the United States. So that's the, that's the goal and the dream. And we can do that. We could probably team with, with Caesar in some way to, to uh, work on a, on a, a training curriculum to, to, to create trainers. But right now we do it, you know, in the prison environment up to this point, they have a trainer who's interested in the program has to shadow another trainer in prison to, to learn how it goes. Mm. But um, obviously that's not efficient enough of a, of a way to produce trainers. We have to get people some experience on the outside and really start to create more qualified trainers who can run the program. And the program is funded solely by donations? Yeah. How does it yes. work? Yeah. yeah, it's solely by donations. And it costs about 50K to, one, to run one program for a year. So we could do 30 dogs. That's three rounds, three 14 week long rounds. So we could do, you know, es essentially 30 dogs and 90 student inmates for $50,000. So that's a, that's, you know, 50 two weeks roughly okay that, that's 500 dollars per person right something right. yeah exactly yeah 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 so it's 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 very possible and easily probable hmm. and possibly that uh is also something which would be very useful and helpful in other countries right all around the world totally. we have a lot of interest from from great britain uh from australia Australia, we've had some interests. Uh, yeah, nowhere in mainland Europe or Western Europe, but uh, yeah, Great Britain and, and and also Canada. Yeah, so who knows? There's definitely definitely a possibility. This type of rehabilitation is, and also if you think about animals, the the shift towards dogs is taking place all over the world. So that same shift towards like the same shift that happened for you mm -hmm. personally. Is happening for a lot of people around the world. A lot of different, a lot of cultures are accepting, you know, like the, the rescue dog. Uh, re rescue dogs are becoming more of a mainstream part of society. You know. Yeah. Well, uh, Zach, yeah, this was really a wonderful conversation, and hopefully, we inspired you, inspired quite some people out there about, yeah, what you do and our wonderful companions. Is there? something you you want to share to our listeners oh i just appreciate you man you have a great energy you got a great smile you great engagement yeah. and uh, i i talk too much thanks to so, all the doggy <laughs> yeah, you're, you're great with that man so thank you i'm just just grateful to be able to reach a new audience and to get to share about some of these things and uh if folks want to get involved they can go to marley's mutts dog rescue on facebook or marley's mutts on instagram uh positive change has its own page so at positive change program p-a-w-s-i-t-i-v-e because everything in the pet world has to be a funny word you know like positive <laughs> instead of yeah um so yeah and, and then i'm just zach scow z-a-c-h-s-k-o-w my last name is danish in case you're wondering and uh, okay? yeah yeah 
just to let you know, I will add all the resources, all your um, information in the show notes of this episode. So everybody is very much invited to learn more about what you do and um, yeah, follow you and your work and possibly also support it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, so, thank you. You did great, man. I really appreciate it. That was awesome. And your yeah, English is you. tremendous. Likewise, yeah. It was to me. It was uh, as a service. Yeah, I was just <laughs> sitting here and, <laughs> and um, yeah, listening to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for yeah. uh, inspiring us here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, man. Yeah, thank you all for watching this and being with us, being open, curious, and uh, appreciating our yeah little doggies. Yeah. Uh, see all you right, next time. Goodbye.